Well, good morning, church family. If you would, take your Bibles and turn with me to the third chapter of the book of Ruth, as we are in week three of four of our sermon series, Redemption on the book of Ruth. As I've mentioned to you, uh, this book is so helpful to us because it is about God's ordinary providence. When we think about the word redemption, we naturally go and think about the book of Exodus, but the reality for most of us is that we don't gather manna from heaven every morning. We don't drink water from a rock, uh, and we certainly, most of us, have not walked through a sea on dry land. Uh, But the book of Ruth is all about how God moves in redemptive ways in the everyday and in the ordinary. And I do want to give a shout out uh, to Juan Sally, who preached an excellent message on Ruth chapter 2 last Sunday. I want to tell you how the conversation went when I got home from the Brentwood campus around the lunch table. Hey guys, how was church today? How'd Juan do? Dad, he's good. Dad, he's funny. You know, Brandon Abbott, who preached a couple of weeks ago, he's funny too. Dad, why aren't you more funny, right? So that's what happens. But listen, I'm grateful uh, to have such, such capable men uh, to be able to fill in when I have to be gone and uh, grateful for walking through this book. And Juan did a great job of bringing us up to this next movement. And as we get there, today we're going to see a window of an opportunity uh, that Naomi and Ruth have. And so for me, studying the story this week, I went back in time in my mind uh, to a beautiful fall day. It was the fall of 1993 on the little Midwestern College campus where I attended. And so uh, after class one day, we had had a presentation in class. And so uh, the presenter came in and shared that there was a ministry opportunity there for college kids. And so we had a big brothers type, big sisters program uh, that the college ran. And so uh, they said, the professor said, hey, you can get extra credit, right? If you participate in this program. And so me and one of my classmates walked out of the class and we were talking about this. Hey, are you going to do it? I'm thinking about it. There was going to be a big retreat to kick off the year. And so as we're standing there on our version of the quad talking about this, another young lady walks up. Now, this is the young lady I had already spied at freshman orientation. This is the young lady that I strategically positioned myself to sit behind in chapel so that I could keep my eye on her, right? And every time she flipped her long brown hair like this, right, music started to play. I saw butterflies and stars, Full confession, didn't hear anything, right, that was being said in chapel, right? It was just like, how can I somehow meet her? Well, as providence would have it, the young lady in my class and this young lady happened to have gone to high school together. So as we're sitting there talking about this retreat and this ministry opportunity, lo and behold, up walks this beautiful young lady. And so at this point in the conversation, right, I'm talking about the retreat and I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to play this. And so as we're talking about the retreat, I'm telling her about the ministry. And at one point, right, she says, well, that sounds kind of interesting. I might like to get involved. And I was like, oh, yeah, 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 you should, you should definitely think about getting involved, right? And I said, I mean, it's for the kids. I mean, these kids really, right? And you guys all can tell where this is going. So she said, well, how would I sign up for this weekend retreat? And I said, well, here's the administrative building. It's right up the steps to your right, down the hall, right? The sign-up sheet's right there. You can't miss it. And here it was, Right? I said, you could help these kids. And I took my opportunity, my window. I said, and besides, what could you do better than hang out with me all weekend? (laughs) And this is the moment. And guys, you've been there, right? You're like, okay, it's out there. What's going to happen, right? I'm holding my breath at this point. Where's this conversation going to go? She goes, well, in that case, I should be running up those steps to sign up. And inside, I was like, yes! (laughs) And so... We went on the retreat. We ministered to kids all weekend. We came back. I asked her out. A couple weeks later, we snapped this picture. So my face, right, will tell you everything you need to know (laughs) about how things went. Look at those sideburns, right? So styling, profiling back in those days. See that brown hair? I told you. Gorgeous then, gorgeous now. And so 27 years later, we were 18 years old in this picture, right? The Lord has been good to us. As a matter of fact, today is Senior Recognition, Senior Sin Sunday. Lexi, our second daughter, 18 years old today. I mean, I'm that many years old in my mind still, right? But you know, the reality is that in God's plan, big things have small beginnings. It's true throughout the Bible. Think about it. God tells Abraham to go, and he went. That's what the Bible says, right? And the whole story of God's people begins with that. Moses, 
out taking care of sheep on the backside of the desert somewhere in Midian. He notices a bush. Something's not quite right. It's the beginning, right, of what God was doing. David, he's out tending sheep, and God is teaching him in those quiet moments things that he would impress upon his heart that would lead him when he became king. Small things God uses in big ways. The same is true of the moment that we're going to see the window of opportunity that Naomi and Ruth have in Ruth chapter 3. Will you stand with me in honor of God's word as we read this morning? We're going to read the first five verses and then keep your Bibles open as we'll work our way through this chapter. Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, shouldn't I find rest for you so that you will be taken care of? Now, isn't Boaz our relative? Haven't you been working with his female servants? This evening, he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfumed oil, and wear your best clothes. Go down to the threshing floor, but don't let the man know that you were there until he has finished eating and drinking. And when he lies down, notice the place where he's lying. Go in and uncover his feet and lie down. Then he will explain to you what you should do. And so Ruth said to her, I will do everything you say. I will do everything you say. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, would we follow the example of Ruth, who ruthlessly trusted her mother-in-law, who put her complete and total trust in you. So God, would we see today that in your sovereignty, we're called to be full participants as we embrace the next step that you have for us on the journey. It's in your name we pray these things, Lord Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Now, as we begin to walk through this text, I, I want to remind you where we're at in the story. A couple of weeks ago, we started with chapter one and we started it with grief because that's where the story begins. In a dark time, in the period of the judges, the camera zooms in on one family. And Elimelech, he takes his family, and because there's famine, he tries to go over to the neighboring tribe. And as he's there, right, he dies, his two sons die. And so Naomi and her two daughters-in-law, that's all that's left. And I love the way that Ruth teases out some of life's biggest questions for us, practical questions. Where is God in my grief? Is God with me or is he against me? I love the honesty of Naomi, right? I'm no longer Naomi, which means pleasant or sweet, but I am now bitter because the Lord's hand is against me. That's all she can see at that moment in her grief. But the storyteller, the narrator, is telling us all the time, God is up to something. Last week, Juan walked you through chapter two. In chapter two of the story, we see, and this is one of my favorite verses in the book of Ruth, is verse three, where Ruth decides to get up and to go gather some grain to make some bread so they can survive to live another day. And in verse three, it says she happened to step into the field belonging to Boaz. The narrator is giving us a huge hint, hint, wink, wink, right? That God's hand is in her steps. That God is at work because as she returns home with 30 pounds of grain, way more than somebody should have just been able to gather, Boaz is kind to them and sends her home with enough food to feed her and Naomi for a month. Naomi instantly recognizes that God is up to something. And it helps us answer that big question, right? Where is God at work in the details of my everyday life? Because sometimes we wonder where he's at, and yet we see him, right, guiding providentially the footsteps of Ruth in that story. Well, today we're going to get into this idea, right? The big idea is if God is sovereign, then what role do I have to play? If God is the one at work, right, then what's the initiative? What what is it that I'm called to do? Specifically in this context, how does God work in our relationships? And so as we get into this text today, I need to give you a couple of ground rules of biblical interpretation. I need to remind you of a couple of things that are important anytime we study the Bible, but especially in this story, because let's be honest, among Bible scholars, Ruth chapter three is a little infamous. First thing I need to remind you is this, narratives are not always normative. What I mean by that is just because the Bible says this happened in a story doesn't mean that you're supposed to do it. Often the Bible is telling you what happened. It is describing the action. It is not prescribing what you are supposed to do in every single situation. We have to remember that. 
The second thing that goes with it is this, is that cultural context is always key. Part of being a good student of the Bible is that we don't start with what does it mean to me? We ask the question, what does it mean, period? And that means often that you have to go back and you have to do your homework so you understand what was happening culturally. It's really important that you do this, or especially in a passage like this, you're going to miss some important realities or you're going to misapply it. We, let's just be honest, are pretty fuzzy on what Middle Eastern courtship rituals were like all these many years ago, but we can be clear about the principles that are laid out here. Let me just put it bluntly, and you're going to pick up on this as we go through the text. My four daughters sat in the previous service at nine o'clock. This is not prescribing how I'm going to teach them to date men, all right? Let's just go ahead and get that out in the open. You have to understand the cultural context and what is happening here to properly understand this passage. So with that, let's dive in. First part, the part we just read, Naomi's plan. Naomi coaches Ruth towards a hope and a future. Naomi is going to coach Ruth towards a hope and a future. As I've already mentioned, we have seen a turn in the first two chapters in Naomi's countenance and her attitude. She loses her husband. She loses her son. She's forced to kind of crawl back to her hometown of Bethlehem without anything. The women all are like, who is this? Naomi, translation, she doesn't look good. It's been a rough 10 years. And so Naomi is honest. As I said a moment ago, she's bitter. She can't see what God is up to. But as God begins to move into the story, her hope begins to grow. And hope is a powerful thing. And so we see the very first kind of positive thing out of Naomi at the beginning of this chapter. Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, shouldn't I find rest for you so that you will be taken care of? Ruth has pretty much been taking care of Naomi up to this point. Well, now Naomi is showing kindness. She's showing love and concern for Ruth. This word rest, when we read it in English, let's be honest, most of us guys in the room can't wait to get home from church so we can take our Sunday afternoon nap. Can I get an amen? Right? So that's when we heard rest, right? We're, we're that tired most of the time. We're like, oh, man, just a moment to take a nap, right? We think about sleep. Some of us might think about vacation. The word rest here is significant in the original language, in the Hebrew. It means well-being. It means wholeness. Our mission statement, engaging the whole person, right, with the whole gospel of Jesus Christ. And what she's saying here is that, Ruth, what I want for you is for your life to be made whole. I want you to have stability. I want you to have provision. I want what's best for you. I want you to have a hope and a future. And in this era, in this moment, the only way that you could find that, if you were a woman in that society, was through a family, was through a husband. And so in this era, there was no Bachelorette Bethlehem edition, right? That wasn't going to be what would work for Ruth. And so Naomi begins to come up with a plan. And that plan, right, is her her gracious initiative towards Ruth, saying, Ruth, I want to have a way for you to be able to find the husband who can give you the hope in the future that you deserve. You have been loyal and faithful to me. Well, now I want to be loyal and faithful to you in return. And you, I know, are an outsider to our culture, so I'm going to coach you through this whole thing. Anybody who's familiar with movies, great books, storytelling, screenwriting knows that in every epic journey, the hero always has to have a mentor. And so in the Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien, it's who? It's Gandalf, right? The wizard. In Star Wars, it's the little green guy. What's his name? Yoda, right? There's always this older, wiser mentor who is helping the hero understand what the next step should be. And so Naomi begins to take on that role in this passage and helping Ruth understand how she can connect and engage with Boaz. And so in this moment, we need to understand the setting in which she coaches her through. She says that she needs to approach Boaz on the threshing floor. The threshing floor means a couple of things. One, it means that it's the time of harvest. So there's an urgency to Naomi's words. The barley harvest, it's almost over. Their ability to go out and get, you know, glean grain and to, to grab grain out of the fields, well, that window is closing. And then how are they going to eat? So Naomi sees this as a critical window of opportunity and instructs her to go to the threshing floor. Here's a picture of what a threshing floor looks like. You see, they would put the stalks of grain there on a large circular area, usually with stone underneath. 
They would have these large oxen, right, that would trample those stalks, right, to get it down into finer pieces. And then you've got the farmer there with the pitchfork or the winnowing fork who would then take what was crushed, toss it up in the air, and allow the wind to blow away the straw and the chaff, and the grain would fall down. It's pretty ingenious. And cultures all over the world, right, practice this. Some still practice it to these days. These threshing floors, by the way, were not in secretive locations. They were generally on a hilltop because they needed the wind to blow it away. Here's a picture of an ancient threshing floor. This gives you important context because what you need to see is what happened between Ruth and Boaz, right, didn't happen in some secret chamber or room. It happened in a place of community. There's always accountability in community. And so what happened in this conversation that took place took place like this. The men... After working hard all day, of course, would eat their meal. They would lay down to sleep at night and basically camp out. Why? Because they needed to guard the grain so that no one would come and take it. And so it was basically a a guy and a bunch of his servants, right, who were camping out on this hillside. That is the setting. Then we get into Naomi's specific instructions to Ruth, beginning with verse 3. Number one, wash. If you want to find a spouse, taking a bath is always a good idea, right? Right? So you start there, good practical wisdom. Number two, put on perfumed oil. That was kind of their deodorant of the time. I have a 12-year-old son. One of the things I remind him about every morning, right? Did you brush your teeth? Did you comb your hair? Did you put on your deodorant? Because it's important at this stage of life. And number three, wear your best clothes. Now, this has been interpreted in all kinds of ways. Let me tell you what it does not mean. Naomi is not telling Ruth to put on a short skirt and high heels. It's not what this means. Instead, widows, as you know, throughout the Bible, wore a particular outfit. They would wear the clothes of mourning. It depended on the era and the culture, of of course, but Ruth was a widow. And so what Naomi is instructing her to do is to take off her work clothes, to take off her sweatpants. Some of us had to be reminded right after COVID year to get out of sweatpants, and we had to be reminded what our dress clothes look like. She's telling her to to change her clothes so that she appears as the beautiful, eligible to be married woman that she is. That's how Naomi is coaching her. Make yourself presentable. The other thing she tells her, she says, go down to the threshing floor, but don't let the men know you there until he has finished eating and drinking. Translation, don't approach a guy who's worked hard all day and he's now hangry. You don't want to talk to a guy in that situation. Wait until the meal is over. Plus, culturally, not appropriate to address someone at a meal unless you were invited to said meal. This part kind of cracks me up, right? When he lies down, notice the place where he lies down. Translation, make sure it's Boaz because it might be awkward if it's some other guy. So pay attention. Notice the place where he's lying in. Go in and uncover his feet and lie down. Now, let me tell you, I have read a bunch of commentaries this week, and many of them differ in interpretation here. But here, I believe, is the best way to understand this. This was a custom in their culture that was a nonverbal way to propose marriage. It was a nonverbal way to propose marriage. And so there was intentionality in that act. Then, verse 7, then he will explain to you what you should do. And so at this point, Naomi says, you have basically stepped forward and said, I am eligible and available. Now it will be up to Boaz to do his part. And at this moment, Naomi trusts that. He'll know what to do. And it's pretty remarkable to see Ruth's response. What does she say? Humble, obedient, I will do everything that you say. She's already made the big decision, right? Naomi, I'm going with you. Your people are my people. Your God is my God. So Naomi, I'm going to trust you in this situation. And this leads us to the second movement of the story, which is Ruth's proposal, in which Ruth is going to ask Boaz to be the answer for his own prayer for her. And so the plan moves in to motion. Verse 6, she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law had charged her to do. After Boaz ate, drank, and was in good spirits, he went down to, to lie down at the end of the pile of barley, and she came secretly and covered his feet and lay down. Now at midnight, Boaz was startled, turned over, and there lying at his feet was a woman. So we ask, who are you? Now at this moment, we need to pause, and we need to realize all of the ways this plan could have gone very wrong. Number one, there's a whole lot of guys, myself included, 
and we don't like to be woken up in the middle of the night, right? We're grumpy, so who woke me up? What's going on? He could have simply been in a bad mood, right? Number two, obviously in this situation, it could have looked inappropriate. This could have been viewed as an inappropriate gesture. As a matter of fact, the book of Hosea tells us that prostitutes would come to places where guys were laying around camping like threshing floors and offer their services. So he could have jumped up, right? Accused her of something in front of all of these men of trying to proposition him and send her home in shame. Or even worse yet, this is the period of the judges. And yes, this stuff's in the Bible, right? Boaz could have taken advantage of the situation. So that's what's at stake in this moment. But here's what we know. From the moment we're introduced to the character of Boaz, it says what about him? He has noble character. We learn that about him before we even learn that he's a wealthy landowner, right? Everything we've seen of him is kind and is gracious. And so what's happening here, Naomi, right, is believing in what she knows of his character. Now let me say this again, young people, this is not a prescription for how you date, okay? Let me be 100% clear about that. But it is using the customs of the day in order for Ruth to be able to approach Boaz with this request. And I believe even in the setting, it's God's grace because I mentioned earlier, she doesn't have to approach him in his home or in his bedroom. She can approach him at the threshing floor where there are other people around should something go terribly wrong in that moment. And so in this moment, she is laying there. Boaz is startled. He says, who are you? She responds, I am Ruth, your servant. And this word, right, is carefully chosen by Ruth. It's different than the word that she used when she first met Boaz in chapter two. That word for servant means I'm a foreigner. I'm an outsider. The word she uses here means I'm one of your people who needs help. I'm here to serve you, but I'm one of your own. And then we don't have instruction, right, that Naomi actually told her to say this, but here's an example of how I think Ruth gets it. Take me under your wing, she says. That is an idiom in the Bible, right, for people coming to faith in God. They are coming under God's protection. It says this in the book of Psalms, Psalms 36, 7, how precious is your unfailing love, O God. All humanity finds shelter in what? In the shadow of your wing. It also had become an idiom for marriage, that you are coming under the wing, under the protection of a man. And so what's interesting is, if you remember, when Boaz first met Ruth, he prayed this blessing upon her and said, may the Lord bring you under the shadow of his wing. How brilliant is this of Ruth to say, hey, Boaz, remember that prayer that you prayed? Well, now you get a chance to be the answer to your own prayer. What a moment and how intentional she is with her words. For you are what? A family redeemer. For you are a family redeemer. Redeemer. Now here, because I know a lot of you, and again, in the customs of our day, we would say, well, it's not honorable, right, for a woman to propose to a man. That's not the way it works. Well, obviously, unusual situation. But here's the other reason that I don't think at this point Boaz had pursued Ruth for marriage. He knows that he's not the closest guy in the line to redeem her. He is a family redeemer, but he's not the family redeemer. Translation, Boaz is a man of integrity. And so he's not wanting to skip his place in line. I think the hints are there in the text that obviously at this point, Boaz likes Ruth. Ruth obviously wants to come under the wing of Boaz. And so in this moment, Boaz is demonstrating his integrity by not pursuing her, but now she is pursuing him. So he has to make a choice and understand this at this point as well. He's not the brother of the brothers of the sons who had died. And so that means he's not obligated. He can, if he chooses, get involved with the situation, but he doesn't have to. I mean, this is a foreign woman. This is her bitter mother-in-law, you know? Is this really where I wanna get involved? Is this a situation that I want to take in? And so at this moment, let's be honest, if this is a Hallmark movie, we're all leaning in. What's he gonna say? What's he going to do? Leads us to movement three of the story, which is Boaz makes a promise and a redeemer gives his word. We don't have to wait long to hear his answer, but he blesses her for a second time now in the story. 
May the Lord bless you, my daughter. There's a word of affection. You're part of the family. You have shown more kindness, that word has said, now than ever before. Because you have not pursued younger men, whether rich or poor. Translation, you could have followed your heart. You could have chased after some younger guy. You could have chased after some other rich cat in town. But you didn't. Now don't be afraid, my daughter. I will do for you whatever you say, since all the people in my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Bible scholars, does that phrase noble character ring a bell? Proverbs chapter 31. The Proverbs 31 woman. It's translated this way, excellent wife. See, Boaz is saying you are a woman of noble character. You are excellent wife material. And I I bet at that moment, right, Ruth's heart is just racing. Yes, it is true that I am a family redeemer. Here's the integrity of Boaz coming out again. But there is a redeemer closer than I. And I love this. Look with me at verse 13. Stay here tonight and in the morning if he wants to redeem you, that's good. This is the word that jumped out to me off the page this week, good. Here's the reason why. I think at this point it's clear Boaz wants to be with Ruth, Ruth wants to be with Boaz, but Boaz won't jump his place in line. If that closer relative wants to redeem her, wants to marry her, wants to provide for her, then Boaz says, that's good because you will be provided for. That, ladies and gentlemen, is character. To say we're going to do this God's way. We're going to do this the right way. I'm not going to jump in my place in line. I'm not going to manipulate the situation the way that I could. What I'm concerned about most of all is not merely my happiness, but that you and Naomi are provided for. And if that happens, well, then it's good. You see, this is that question, right? God's sovereignty, he's doing his thing, but we do our part. And now all the characters in this story, Naomi has advocated for Ruth. Ruth has been obedient. She's done her part. Boaz is saying he is willing to do his, and we're going to have to see what happens. He says, if he does, that's good. Let him redeem you. But if he doesn't want to redeem you, as the Lord lives, I will. Now lie down until morning. In other words, it's not safe for you to walk home by yourself in this era, in this part of town, late at night. So stay here quietly. In the morning, she wakes up. He gives her six, right, huge portions of grain. And this is pretty interesting on a couple of fronts. And so one of the the realities about this much grain is that it was a sign again of his generosity. It was practical. If somebody was like, Ruth, why were you at the threshing floor? She's like, just getting my breakfast, right? Just getting my grain as I'm hauling this back. But it was also placed into a shawl. What do shawls carry in those parts of the world? Babies. In other words... This situation is pregnant with possibilities of what God can do. And it leads us to the fourth part of the movement, which is this, that God provides. God provides. All the characters, right, have done their part. And by the way, although it is delicate, there's no sense of any impropriety that went on here between Ruth and Boaz. And so their noble character has been upheld. They are are trusting God for the results. And so, verse 16, she went to her mother-in-law, Naomi, who asked her, what happened, my daughter? The literal translation in Hebrew is this. Who are you, my daughter? Does Naomi know who Ruth is? Yes. What's she saying? Has your status changed? Are you engaged? Translation, is it time to start shopping for that wedding dress yet, right? She's jumping the gun just a little bit here. But Ruth told her everything the man had done for her. And he said, he gave me these six measures of barley because he said, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty handed. Do you remember when Naomi showed back up at Bethlehem? What did she say? I'm bitter and I'm empty handed. Now, Boaz, by this act of this grain, right? Of this generous grain that he was giving to them was telling her, I'm not only going to take care of Ruth if I'm able, I'm also going to take care of you, Naomi. You won't be empty-handed any longer. That's a man of character, right? He not only wants the girl, right? He is willing to take the family that comes with it. He is willing to fulfill his responsibility. And in this verse, my daughter, wait until you find out how things go, for he won't rest. There's that word rest again until he resolves this today. And this is what I love about this passage, how it comes around. Brilliant storytelling on the part of the author. This idea of rest. Boaz, his character will not allow him to rest until he makes sure that you are at rest. 
that your well-being is taken care of. We need some more mighty good men like Boaz in our world today who are full of integrity, who don't take advantage of the situation, who do what they're called to do when that moment of opportunity comes. But this is the hard part of the story. We have to wait to see what happens. There's another kinsman redeemer. We don't know what he's going to do. And so to be continued, you got to come back next week. I'm just telling you, right? It's the way it works. But this is life because we live in that tension between believing in the sovereignty of God and walking it out in our everyday life. So our staff has been reading a book called A Praying Life by Paul Miller. We read a couple chapters and we process it as a team every week. It's a great work on practical prayer. You can tell this guy walks with the Lord and he gives us and teaches us some great examples in that. And he talks about this idea of living in the tension. How do we live in these moments like Naomi and Ruth and Boaz are in right now? We have done our part and now we have to wait for things that are beyond our control. He gives us three clues. I wanna put them on the screen for you as our takeaways today. Number one is this, you don't demand that the story go your way. You have to remember the story is not primarily about me. Naomi, Ruth, Boaz, great characters, but is the story about them? No, the hero of the story is Yahweh. It's what God is doing among his people. It's what God is doing to preserve a family. We'll see you next week. We'll come back to this idea again, right? But we can't demand that the story go our way. Again, this moment for Boaz where he says, oh my goodness, yes, I want to be your kinsman redeemer. But if this other guy steps up and takes his place in the line, then it's good. That shows a ruthless trust in the story of God, an inherent trust that he is not demanding that the story go the way he wants it to, but he is going to trust God to work out the details, and we have to as well. The second takeaway for us in this moment is that we always need to look for the storyteller. When you're in the middle of the tension, when you're in the middle of the story, you are looking for clues of how God is at work that are consistent with his word and consistent with the way he's always worked in the hearts and the lives of his people. Even when things are difficult, like chapter one, the storyteller is giving us hints, isn't he? Where does the story take place, church? Wow, really? I know, I know, I've been going for a while, but where does the story take place? Bethlehem, right? Bethlehem. We ever heard of Bethlehem before in the Bible, right? I think so. Translation, big things come from this little town. Hint, hint, wink, wink. Other hints in the story. Into chapter one, everything's desolate, right? But it's the time for the harvest. Like all of these storylines, right, are beginning to find their fulfillment. There's all these hints. I, I, I love this interview I saw with Mr. Rogers several years ago. Anybody grow up watching Mr. Rogers? All right, so love that guy, Tom Hanks movie, right? A little creepy how much he resembled Mr. Rogers, but it was great. So one of the interesting things in this interview that was shared was that a parent asked him, it was kind of a Q&A, and said, Mr. Rogers, you know, something scary happened in our town. I can't remember, fire or something like that. Uh, what do you instruct? How do you teach kids? What can you do for small children who can't understand everything that's going on in a moment of sheer terror and chaos? And he said, I tell them this, look for the helpers. If you're watching something on TV, right? Or if you're witnessing something yourself, look for the helpers. Teach those children, where are the police officers? Where are the firefighters? Where are the EMTs? Help teach them in that moment to look for the good and the ugly. Teach them to look for the helpers in the midst of the chaos. In the same way as we look at the events of our life, we have to look to dust for the fingerprints of God, how he is at work in the middle of the story. And so certainly now, right, Naomi has picked up on, oh yeah, okay, God is in this. These things aren't coincidence. Boaz is field. You meet Boaz. He's in our line of kinsman redeemer. Look for the fingerprints of the author in your story. And last but certainly not least, number three, stay in the story. Keep walking. Keep doing the next right thing. What has God called you to do? Again, as I mentioned, right, it started with a step. Ruth, what unlocked her destiny, what unlocked her future was her going out to gather grain just to make cereal, right? For breakfast in the morning. And so in that moment, right, she stepped into the field belonging to Boaz. 
in this moment. She is trusting God and Boaz is trusting that all this is going to work out. So you've got to keep walking. You've got to stay in the story because you don't know how the story ends, but our sovereign God does. And so keep walking, keep putting one foot in front of another and remember Remember the blessing of God that God longs to bless his people because this is a picture of the gospel of grace. Naomi and Ruth, they don't deserve this kind of kindness. Even Boaz recognizes that Ruth's kindness towards him, he doesn't deserve. But it's grace upon grace, as John chapter 1 tells us, that keeps the story moving, that keeps us in it one step at a time. So wherever you're at in the story, keep walking. Know that God is is at work. Will you bow your heads with me this morning as we come to this time of response? And today's time of response is special for us because we are recognizing our graduating seniors. We call this the senior sin. You are loved and you are sent. And so in this moment, there are a couple of things that we want to do. One is you are going to have sung over you as you pray. The blessing from the book of Numbers Simply the words of scripture reminding us that the sovereign God is at work in the ordinary providence in the everyday details of our life. Specifically for our seniors, it is a blessing to them as we send them off into the adventure that God has ordained for them. And in just a few moments, we'll have a time of prayer specifically over them. But this moment is a time of prayer for all of us as we actively wait on the Lord as we do our part, as we're not fatalistic. Naomi didn't lay around, right, and tell Ruth to just sit around waiting for a husband to come knock on her door. She did her part, coaching Ruth. Ruth did her part. Boaz did his. And now they're going to trust God with the rest. Today, what in your life is unfinished? Where are you living in the tension? Will you have the faith and courage to keep walking in obedience and faith and in integrity, trusting God to do the rest. And remember that his blessing isn't about stuff. It's about his presence, his provision, and his power in your life. So pray with us as we listen to this song this morning.